So this is a presentation um, on subsurface atmosphere exchange um, of H2O in sublimation environments. Um, and what I'd like to do is, is review the framework of uh, thinking of radical framework uh, we use to understand near surface ice uh, on Mars and draw where possible um, parallels to the dry values of Antarctica, which are basically the, the best known terrestrial analog to a near surface ice uh, on Mars. So here is a, is a photo of Mars and a photo of uh, one of the dry valleys in uh, Antarctica uh, with a meteorological station. And the most significant difference between the two in, in terms of near surface ice is that Mars is much drier. It's, it's colder um, and, and therefore even, even at the saturation levels, it's much drier. So we talk about micro bars in, of partial pressure. So it's 0.1 Pascal, as opposed to on the order of a millibar of partial pressure should be um, uh, 100 Pascal. So, uh, um, and even though the dry valleys are much more humid than uh, Mars, it is considered the driest desert on Earth. So dry in terms of absolute humidity, not in terms of um, uh, relative humidity. Uh, now, and here are uh, just two diagrams to uh, point out the um, physical uh, conditions. And these are mean, annual mean conditions uh, shown here. So, um, uh, you know, even um, the, uh, the interior of Antarctica during a large glacial maximum uh, was more humid uh, than Mars is, is um, uh, nowadays. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it's getting a direction. Um, and so, you know, on, on the right, there's a phase diagram of H2O with a partial pressure on vertical axis, right? So not the total pressure, but partial pressure matters here. And the partial pressure on Mars is you know um, four orders of magnitude lower um, uh, than on Earth. So on Earth we can have uh, sublimation, but most of the time we just have freezing and um, and uh, melting. Uh, but on Mars, you know, we are far uh, away from a triple point. And and one of the consequences of of Mars being so extremely dry that the the active layer is, is devolatilized, is extremely dry, right? So if you were at zero Celsius and 0.1 Pascal, we are far away from ice, we are far away from the liquid phase. So if these phases do exist, they, they you know, disappear quickly. And so many of the processes which go on in an active layer uh, um, you know, on, on Earth um, uh, do not happen on Mars. So here's the uh, uh, basic idea, sort of in, in the absence of a liquid phase, the primary the dominant way of H2O transport is by vapor diffusion, and that's in and out. So, um, uh, you know, the atmosphere is humid and, and water vapor can be exchanged with a buried um, uh, ice table. And, and that's how we, um, the, we think of near surface ice in Mars, and importantly, there are these big temperature amplitudes uh, on the surface, which then get quickly damped. And so we have to understand that vapor transport in the presence of these large um, uh, temperature amplitudes. And, and, uh, and what this leads to is this concept that the um, humidity of the atmosphere can balance the humidity of the ice table, uh, even where there is no ice on the surface. So here is, a, is a, to the left, the photo, by a Phoenix lander um, on Mars, and there is, you know, there is no ice whatsoever on the surface, but just at five centimeter depth, there is a permanent uh, ice table. Um, and this ice, we think, is an equilibrium with a vapor in the atmosphere. It's not, it's not retreating or anything, it's an equilibrium. So there's this, this contrast, um, but that's, uh, that's uh, we uh, can actually um, explain perfectly well with, with theory. Of, of vapor transport. Um, and so, so, you know, the, the uh, diffusion uh, involves a gradient in vapor density, but importantly, uh, you know, a number of molecules per volume, not the relative humidity, but the absolute humidity. And in a non-isothermal environment, then what can happen is you have a warm unsettled regions, um, which has more water molecules 
uh, per volume than a cold saturated region. And there can be a flux toward the already uh, saturated uh, region. And, and then we can time average um, these um, uh, transport equations. And if a vapor diffusivity is um, not strongly correlated with a vapor density, uh, then the, um, you know, the average, the time average just goes, goes through and the net flux, time averaged vapor flux is given by the time averaged vapor density, uh, which in turn uh, can determine from a time averaged vapor density on a surface and a time averaged vapor density um, of the ice table. Um, mathematically, one can do this time averaging also with a heat flux, which is an interesting exercise, but I'll skip it here. This is the result of a microphysical um, uh, modeling of vapor diffusion in a sense that there is um, not just vapor diffusion, but also a temporary condensation or desublimation, I should say, of the, um, of the vapor when it's cold enough and so on. But if one averages that over a Mars year, uh, and you know, Mars years are fairly repeatable. Whether on Mars is actually quite repeatable. Uh, if one averages over Mars year or many Mars years, um, you know, the time average vapor density between the surface and the ice table is going to be a straight line. And, and we can infer um, you know, this line just by looking at the value on the surface and the value of the ice table. Um, despite all the microphysical processes going on in the layer between desorption, uh, adsorption, um, uh, condensation or sublimation and so on. Um, you know, in, in terrestrial environments, one can't do that uh, because um, there's other mass fluxes, but vapor diffusion, but on Mars, um, this, this works. And so um, I wanna dwell some more on this point of how can you have an ice-free surface um, in equilibrium with a permanent ice table, right? And so uh, to do that, this is, an, uh, this is a time series um, <clears throat> from that MET station I showed earlier um, in, uh, in Beacon Valley in Antarctica. And in southern summer, you know, the partial pressure gets very high. So there's a lot of humidity in the atmosphere uh, in southern summer, but uh, it's also warmer. So the question is, you know, the, the heat, Will uh, in the atmosphere gets transformed into the ground, right? Which ultimately reaches uh, the ice table, uh, which in therefore increases the vapor pressure of the ice table. And and so you know what 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 does an, uh, there's a competing effect between the humidity during a warm event and the heat uh, provided by a warm event. You know, and what stabilizes the ice versus what contributes to, to loss of the of this ice. Um, and and so one can. Um, um, uh, you know, do that, and and um, as is shown on a, on the next slide here. So here I, I define a stabilization index that uh, is, um, you know, a partial pressure in the atmosphere minus the annual mean of that uh, partial pressure in the atmosphere. Uh, so that's what increase the humidity in the atmosphere, and subtracting from that is the increase of the vapor pressure of the ice table due to the temperature increase. So this is the heat contribution um, uh, to the ice table relative to the um, mean value multiplied by the, the, the you know, how much um, the rate at which this temperature increases the partial pressure. So I call that a stabilization index, but it's really a, a, a partial pressure. And it tells us, uh, if, so if that index is larger zero, it means that instantaneous event contributes uh, more than average conditions uh, to stabilization of the ice table. And the negative index says it, it, it will cause um, an, um, uh, a loss of the ice. Now, it doesn't mean that loss happens at that moment. It's just the contribution to the total balance. <clears throat> and here are data points you know, over, over one year uh, uh, and so on. And, um, and so there are events, you know, like which are warm and humid, and there are events which are warm and, and dry, like a fern event. And one can really say this event, you know, this fern uh, led to the degradation um, uh, of the ice. So uh, this warm, humid events just contribute a lot <clears throat> of the water vapor uh, and allow this ice table to exist. At night, <clears throat> the humidity is sort of negligible, uh, no matter what. 
Um, and so, um, uh, the, but they draw so much heat, it cools the ice table and therefore reduces vapor pressure of the ice table. So, so what I like about this is that it really shows you know, how the role of a temperature amplitude. So if, without a temperature amplitude, we would need 100% you know, humidity on a surface all the time to balance the vapor pressure of the ice table. But with an amplitude, you know, this is a min-max difference of 40, uh, 40 Celsius on Mars, but min-maximum difference would be twice as high, probably 80 Celsius. So with an, um, a large amplitude, it's fairly easy, um, so to speak, to put enough uh, vapor in the, into the atmosphere um, to balance the ice table, right? Um, now also, you know, conceptually, you know, I can think, suppose we have relative humidity of 80% all the time, right? Then we still get a high stabilization index. And, and at night, there will be, you know, practically impossible to, to prevent um, saturation, but at least conceptually, we could have 80% humidity all the time and still balance the vapor pressure of the ice table. So we never, ever, in principle, never ever need 100% humidity of the atmosphere, and still the atmosphere will contain, on a time average, more vapor than is, is at the ice table, right? And that explains, you know, the observation by Phoenix that you have an ice-free surface um, in the Caribbean with a permanent ice table. All right, so um, uh, the Caribbean ice table um, uh, has been sort of confirmed or studied in, in, in many ways. So here's a lab experiment where, you know, where, where a, a, um, a temperature gradient drives vapor into the ground and there'll be ice forming by desublimation directly in the soil. And then uh, a highly reflective, um, you know, disk on a surface and a highly absorbing disk on a surface. So that will make it warmer. The other one will make it uh, cooler, and there was a headspace of a given humidity. And a lot of the penalty here shows the depth to the ice table was measured after this experiment um, went on for a while. And uh, where it's colder, the ice table is closer to the surface. Where it's uh, warmer, the ice table is uh, deeper. And at the bottom here is a model calculation for the Phoenix uh, landing site. Um, so there's a DM was constructed from the um, ice exposed by the lander and the uh, uh, diamonds are uh, data, the depths, measured depths. And, and this in response to a rock, the ice table is predicted to perform so that the thin solid line is a model of prediction. So this you know, confirms that vapor diffusion indeed controls the depth to the ice table uh, on Mars. Um, and here are, uh, you know, measurements of the depth of the ice table from neutron spectroscopy, which is very low uh, spatial resolution. Um, but one uh, does get it, uh, this um, ice table depth uh, as a function of, of latitude with some smoothing going on. And then uh, the blue and the red are two sets of model predictions uh, done by independent, uh, independently developed models. And uh, um, uh, mine is the, is the red line. So I, I argue uh, that um, there's a reasonable, um, uh, you know, match between the observations and the model predictions versus the, the bloom lines um, argue that the atmospheric humidity would have to be uh, higher. And you have never sat down to really sort out what the difference is between these models. But, um, uh, but again, again, to, to leading order, uh, we understand the depth to the ice table, at least in a top meter, not deeper than that, but in top meter um, on Mars based on the equilibrium ice table uh, theory. Now, if the ice table is out of equilibrium, it will, um, you know, it'll be ice loss or, or gain. Um, and, and here are the rates at this um, occurs and the rates uh, are actually similar in a dry valley than, in, than on Mars because the diffusion coefficient is higher on Mars because atmospheric pressure is lower. <clears throat> and so it just, it just happens, so it's not that different. And so if you talk about rates, so, 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 on, so on Mars, so I should say that the green line is for a um, with retreat rate for a perfectly dry atmosphere. And the dash blue lines are, if, if one takes into account that the humidity will uh, delay or stop even uh, the sublimation loss. So in, in, in the dry valleys, 
the humidity slows the sublimation loss, but it doesn't uh, stop it, at least under, under current climate conditions. Uh, and on Mars at some latitudes, um, of course, it will um, there will be an equilibrium ice table, no loss. And uh, so we talk about rates of, you know, here on, on Mars of, uh, you know, um, a centimeter per thousand years. So this is fast enough to uh, follow the Milankovitch cycles. The Milankovitch cycles of Mars are, are listed below 120,000, and 51,000 uh, years. So there will be, um, there can be substantial um, volume changes of ice over these time periods. And therefore it had time to reach equilibrium with a present day uh, uh, atmosphere. Um, now, if there, um, if there is a stability for ice in a subsurface, but no ice yet, um, there will be ice forming. And this is a concept uh, really studied by Mellon and Tchaikovsky in 1993. The, the simulation is my own, but they uh, really uh, studied this for the first time. And what happens is that temperature cycles uh, at each year, each season, um, push um, some uh, ice into the ground. And there will be a permanent uh, part to it, and this is a seasonal part here, and the permanent part, and that ice uh, concentration will just grow with time. Uh, now, this has been uh, this, this is a result of a laboratory experiment doing that, although it did not use temperature cycles, instead, it used a, a static temperature gradient to create a, a gradient in vapor densities. And it used, uh, instead of soil, it used glass beads because it makes it more reproducible. Um, as one you know pours the soil into the uh, um, into the um, container repeatedly, and and what and this um, there's this ice tendrils forming, you know, so the vapor uh, gradient you know it saturates and there's ice tendrils forming, uh, something we did not uh, expect, um, but that's what um, occurs, and uh, one can even find bubbles. So this is desublimation ice. It never goes through the liquid phase. This is directly deposited, directly grows in the interpore spaces from a vapor phase. And there's bubbles in there, right? Uh, and certainly I didn't um, expect, and, and you know, there's a rich phenomenology to this that um, has yet to be um, uh, explored. And this process, of course, uh, might also happen in a dry valleys of an Arctic car, um, <clears throat> although it's, it's really hard to, to uh, you know, avoid um, uh, the liquid phase, even, even in dry valleys. Now, here at the top, this is a, you know, over general uh, uh, comparison uh, between uh, um, Earth and Mars, uh, or, you know, terrestrial permafrost environments and, and Mars environments. Um, uh, but even so, it highlights some important differences, um, particularly the partial pressure of H2O on Mars is just orders of magnitude lower than the triple point pressure. Well, on Earth, it's, you know, comparable or often, you know, very often above the triple point. Um, and without the liquid uh, phase, the dominant mode of H2O transport is vapor diffusion. <clears throat> now on Earth, we have vapor diffusion too, <clears throat> but, um, you know, there are other ways, uh, you know, just percolation of, of liquid, which are much more effective in, in uh, vapor transport. And uh, because um, vapor diffusion at low temperature is very slow, the process is, is not energetically limited, but, but transport limited, diffusion limited. So there are many uh, uh, difference, fundamental differences. Uh, <clears throat> between, um, you know, between us, the literature on terrestrial permafrost and, um, and uh, the way we, we think near surface ice has to be understood um, uh, uh, on Mars. Um, and here I list a few uh, open problems. Uh, let me just mention one interesting point is that this pumping phenomenon of driving vapor into the ground might also happen on the moon starting with absorbed water molecules on the, on the surface um, <clears throat> rather than a humid atmosphere. 